Next is austenite. And I'll look up a micrograph of all these as we're doing them. When steel is heated above the upper critical temperature, it rearranges atoms to face centered cubic structure and is a gamma iron. That's when it's losing magnetism. I did do a video out in the lab on Friday, heating that up and uh, letting the magnet fall off once it got the face center. So let's go ahead and look up Austinites tonight so we can see the difference. Austinite. This is Martin's site. Austinite. Like that? That's a pretty simple one to look at. You just fit your phase diagram right here, so they're raising the temperature, percent of carbon right here. As they're raising it, it's going to ferric perlite, ferric to austenite, just to austenite. That's, that's a phase diagram. Let's add microstructure to that because, yeah, there it is. So we're going to go over polishing of the specimens here, the second half of this class, and you're going to cut it, put the acid on, well, I've cut it, polish it, then put the acid on, and then you look at this, and it will be identified as austenite, so they can tell the, the phase of what it is. That's the grain structure. Martensite is either really not desirable or really desirable. And steel is heated above, whoops, oh yeah, all right, above the upper critical. temperature and is quenched. It changes to a body centered tetragonal structure. The microstructure looks like needles almost. This distortion in the lattice is what causes hardness. What's in this? One of the main things, well, an important thing to come out of this course is to know that when you heat up steel and quench it, it gets hard, right? You ever hear you're not supposed to cut through stuff that's been welded, right? Technically, if you're doing low carbon steel, it doesn't have enough carbon in it to get real hard. But this is why when you're doing weld tests, they say air cool, right, instead of putting it in the water. Everybody know what quench means? I had when I was interviewing for this job, I remember I was going over something like this in, in the sample lecture, 
And I said, and then you clench it, and I kept going, and this guy goes, whoa, 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 whoa. What's clenching mean? You're talking to layman's, right? So it's obvious in the welding program what quenching is. They quench stuff all the time, right? They weld it, they go over to the quench tank, and they go <laughs> into the water, and steam goes all over the place. And But the machines don't do that, right? So and basically what it is is, is to rapidly cool is what it means. And there's different, there's a bunch of different quenching medias, which we'll go over when we're doing tempering and things like that. Because sometimes they want it to be hard, but they don't want it to be so hard that if you hit it, it'll, it'll fracture, right? Like if you're making knives or swords, right? They're going to do a tempering on it. But martensite is extremely hard. So when you quench a high carbon steel after it's been heated, it gets really, really hard. All right. And the uh, microstructure is pretty easy to, to identify. It looks like needles. That's a good one right there. So now compared to austenite, you can tell that difference, right? If you're looking through a microscope, it's pretty obvious this is this is martensite. Now, there's a couple companies that that's a big deal for in the area. One being Cummins, right? Things like rings and things like that, they have to have a certain hardness, right? So they're gonna have a metallurgy lab in that company where they're cutting stuff and polishing it and looking through a microscope. Another one is, um, as an SKF, right? They make bearings. Do you want a bearing to be soft? No, right? Because there's constant friction, I mean. Um, so they have to look at to make sure things are hard. So, like I said, Martin Sites equal either really desired or really not desired, right? Depending on what you're doing. If you need something hard, it's extremely desired. If you don't want it to be hard, because with hardness comes brittleness, right? Lost it, lost it, perlite. This is kind of a mix. Grains formed in a carbon. alloy steels upon slow cooling so it's the opposite of quench slow cooling consisting of alternate hard iron carbide and soft ferrite layers, thus referred to as lamler. Microstructure. Grains far formed in a carbon and alloy steels upon slow slope. <laughs> what the hell that was? Upon slow cooling, consisting of hard, alternate hard iron carbide and soft ferric layers, thus referred to as a lamellar structure. This is an easy one to spot too. I feel like the ones that make something be Austin awesome, Night Ferry for some reason. Let's go up here. Pearl. That's what your great grandmother was named. Pearl. Your grandfather was Merle. That's a good one right there. I call it the zebra steel, but I don't know. That's what it looks like, kind of, right? It's got kind of lines all over the place. The 
but that is your perlite. And that's all the book has for microstructures, but there's two more that are really, I added them. I don't know why the book doesn't have them in it, but. The next one is cementite. A hard, brittle, iron, carbide, present, in cast iron, and most steels. Back up to the perlite, the lamellar, that's like the lines that are in there. It's lamellar. Cementite is usually let's see here. There's a good one. It's calling it right out. It's usually within the perlite. Maybe that's why they don't have it called on the book. I, I don't know. Fe3C. Perlite is Fe3C plus ferrite. Through a process, one made of steel that has a microstructure, microstructure as shown above, what is most likely the composition of the steel? Well, it's a question on a test. So you're looking at me questions like that. Carbon content's a big deal because you got to have a certain carbon content in order for it to harden. If you don't have that carbon content, it can't harden. That's what I was saying like with the welders. Don't cut through a weld. Well, they're welding on low carbon steel, so it doesn't have enough carbon in it to actually get hard. And the reason they say don't cut through steel or through a weld is because it's supposed to be hard and it's going to fry the blade. You can do it with a cutoff disc, but technically with a bandsaw, it'll fry the blade. Now we've cut through, I don't know how many welds on that bandsaw blade out there, probably I don't know, 100 let's say, and that bandsaw blade is fine. That's because it's not, it doesn't have enough carbon in it to get hard. There's a certain number, I want to say it's 0.2 or 3%. We'll look that up here in a minute. I can never remember it. Bainites. Now I know, I can see why this one's not on there. I was taking a class from a guy in a Buff State. It was on it was a materials class, and I said something about a bayonetic microstructure, and he said, "Hey, whoa, 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 whoa! There is no more bayonite. Bayonite's gone. It's no longer a microstructure." I said, "Okay, I don't know. I've always heard of a bayonetic microstructure." And then, like two lectures later, he's like, "You'll get kind of a bayonetic microstructure." Like, whoa, 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 whoa! There is no bayonite, right? Well, so it's one of those things that, I know after that, I just assumed that it was kind of a, it exists, but maybe not on the paper, I don't know. But it's not in the book either, so. But bayonite, what it is, is basically martensite that didn't quite get to martensite. So it's not quite to martensite, but it's called bayonite. I mean, you could look up, like you look right here. scholarly articles for bainite, so I don't I don't know. I've heard of it a lot in the field, so and I was went through, when I went through school we went over bainite, so we're going over bainite. It exists obviously, right? You just saw scholarly articles on it, right? So bainite is an aggregate of iron, carbide, And ferrite formed from austenite, below the temperature 
At which, perlite forms, and above that at which martensite forms. So it's kind of a mix again. So it's slightly less hard than martensite. It's not quite to martensite. I would assume that maybe bainite would be a, a, a mistake, or maybe you didn't quench it fast enough, or in the, in the correct media. The media is basically, did you quench it in water, air, oil, furnace, refrigeration box, there's all kinds of stuff. That's what they were doing for the DOT test. You're not allowed to quench the plates when you weld them. And I go over there, there's a guy with an air compressor just blowing on it. I'm like, that's quenching it, man. Like, what do you mean? It's not going in water. I said, there's air hardening steels, man. I go, that's quenching it. When you're blowing air on it, you're cooling it faster than it's supposed to cool. Right? right there, difference between bainite and martensite. That's probably a common question. It's just martensite is more hard than bainite. Bainite is almost like you question it, but you didn't quite get it to martensite, right? <laughs> Do you remember what the... Seamless part of bainite. So yeah, remember the martensite uh, micrograph? It was all sharper needles, so it kind of looks like martensite, but it's just not quite there. That's all it is. But the problem with bainite, bainite is probably looked at more than martensite because bainite means you probably either didn't anneal it quite good, well enough or you didn't harden it quite well enough, right? So it's probably less than desirable, especially on a pipe. I mean, that's this is right here, right? bainite, seamless pipes. Or maybe they want it that way. They want it to be hard, but not quite as brittle. So, I don't know. It all depends on the application of all this stuff. Depends where it's going, right? If you have impact, you don't want martensite, right? If you want wear resistance, though, you want martensite, right? Because you don't want to wear. So, if you want it to bend, you want it in a ferrite or a perlite, right? Oops. Wrong shoe. So, those are the microstructures. Now, we're going to go over how to get the microstructures. Now what I did out there in the lab, I filmed that too, doing the microstructure. I, went, I found this old school, oh I forgot a jar. I found this old school nitric acid I had in the back in this plastic jar and there's all these skulls and crossbones all over it. And, and, the, and the thing it was in was plastic and there was cracks all over it. So I like to carry it to the sink like <laughs> It's in the sink right now, it's gonna bring it a glass jar to put it in. But why they keep it in any kind of plastic, I never understood that. Any of those chemicals in chemistry classes that you have the plastic? Glass, right? <laughs> of course, you can drop glass and break too, so I don't know. But anyways, I put it in there and um, it was mixed kind of hot. It's 25%. I think you're supposed to have uh, that sheet I gave you. Uh, low carbon steel, 2 to 5% nitric acid. This was 25%. So it's like, follow the ingredients too, by the way. Because what happened was I forgot that it was souped up when I did it. I think I said 5% in the video. Then I looked at it and it was written on it, 25%. I put it in for like three seconds and it went, I pulled it out. It's like, oh man, it's already burning it off. So I rinsed it off real quick and it actually worked out. But if I would have left it in there as long as I usually do for the 5%, it would have just came out black. So if you over etch it, it gets real dark and black and you can't see it. So. I don't think the machinists do any kind of etching, do they? Just to check hardness, probably. The welders do it um, on a fillet weld. So if you have like a T-joint like this, they put a fillet weld in there. In order to ch check for penetration, they cut it and they put the acid on it to make sure it's eaten into the root. So that's what I did out there because we don't have a microscope anyways. But um, yeah, it's a common test done for, for welds on, on fillet welds. If you do a multi-pass weld, you can see each pass when you do it. It's pretty cool. So, 
Uh, microscopic examination of metals. I used to do uh, micrographs at my work for ESOB. ESOB is a company that wasn't handed over PA, but they were pretty heavily unionized. They got to be done. Uh, they make welding machines, but where we were at, I was in the R&D facility making uh, flux core wires. They were trying to make it so that there are, well, we did flux core, then um, metal core wires. They were trying to make it so there was no silicone when you, after you got done welding, so that they go right into paint, because that's another part of the process, right? If you have to easy silicone it with a wire wheel or whatever. And we did microscopic examination of the wires. That's how small it got down to. And I'll tell you how that went here when we get off the camera here. It's kind of a long story, but it's very relevant. They have plastic. If you have a, something that's too big, they put it in a plastic mold, and that's how they polish it. So they can look at the size of a wire. The wires are 0 0.035 inches to 364 of an inch in diameter. That's how big they are, they're tiny. So you have to put them in an actual mold. Let's see if they have that here. Microscopic examination of metals. Oh, there's the microscope. There's the. There it is. So if you got something real small, if you're ever looking at something real small, they put it in this little plastic mold, and the specimen's right there in the middle. And then as you're taking it over the sandpaper, it polishes it. So ours were probably they were like a full 35 of an inch in the middle. It was barely. So I mean, you can see it, but. Very small. Preparation of the specimen. Should be selected from the area. I went for my bachelor's they were doing etches on robotic welds and I got the feeling that they just thought everybody knew about etches <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why I just go etch that I, was like, I don't even know what you're talking about man <laughs> you know what I mean you, get, you ever get that feeling when they're talking about stuff at the school that they, they thought you should have known that before and you have no idea what they're talking about that's what happened to me with etches they're like go etch that Okay, I feel dull. I'm going to go over and ask this guy what an etch is. What's an etch? You cut the weld in half and you put the acid on it. This guy. So I guess it depends on where you, what program you came out of. Because obviously you're getting exposed to it right now at the associate's level. I was not exposed to it at the associate's level. It, it, yeah, I feel like it's not something that everybody should know. You know, right? <laughs> Just common knowledge, you know. Of course, I do think you should know what a screwdriver is. And I have people that don't know what that is, so... You should know what a screwdriver is. If you don't know what a screwdriver is, get with me after class and I'll show you a screwdriver. You know. Actually, you know, metals, I don't know, not so common, I guess. So you're going to pick out the spot that you need to actually etch. Pretty obvious there, right? Huh? This is the spot I need to etch. So you pick it out. It doesn't have to cut it on here, but you have to cut it in order to get to that area. I guess you didn't have, you wouldn't have to cut it if you just had a piece laying, but usually you cut it. I'm gonna add that. Cut it. They have a, we had a fancy saw at Esau, it was like a, 
it was it had water that shot all over, but it wasn't water. It was a cutting loop, and it was an abrasive wheel that cut it really smooth. So you were coming out like at a hundred grit with the saw cut. I mean, it was real nice. I blew it up one time, but it was all contained. It was pretty cool. It exploded inside the thing, and I had this little guy from India that was an engineer. He came running over. You blew up the wheel. So when's the last time you changed it? He just stared at me. One of those never thoughts. I've never changed that. <laughs> you know. But yeah, I blew it up. So you have to cut it. Once it's cut, then you're going to polish it. Should be polished. by an abrasive paper from 240 to 600 grit. You know what 600 grit is? I found the only place you can get uh, sandpaper that goes to like 600 is for doing cars. Let's see if they got uh, 600 grit. And there's the paper. I wanted to see what the polish looks like. So, there you go. See that? 600 grit. That's polished, right? And they have a series. It looks like a has water running down it, and the paper looks like a, let's see if I can find the paper. Well, kind of like this, but cut cut it in half, so smaller strips. But we were doing small stuff too. But the water flows down it, and you take the specimen, and you go like this, up and down on it, until all the lines are going one way. And that would be like, let's say that's 170 grit paper and the next one over is 250 grit and you turn it perpendicular and you go like this and water's running down the whole time washing away and you're going up and down on it until the lines all go the same way and the next one let's say is 300 grit you turn it perpendicular again until all the lines go the one way and then a piece of sand from the you know bigger grit goes over there and scratches it you've got to start all over again i'll elaborate that on that here in a minute, but a little dry on the board. So you're going to polish it to 240 to 600. The, the better the polish, the better the, the etch, right? So then the etching of the specimen. Etchings are composed of organic or inorganic acids and alkalis. I can't spell alkalis, there it is, dissolved. In alcohol water or other solvents let's go ahead and put real water down So etchings are composed of organic or inorganic acids and alkalized dissolved in alcohol, real water, or other solvents. And I gave you a list of the types of um, types of etchings versus the materials, right? So I gave you a, a, I guess a, whatever you want to call it, a list of how to make it. If you request it on the internet, they're going to require that you show some identification of what you're using for. I tried to get some on the internet and they were like, can you show me your license to get this? 
I just sent my CWI card and they, oh, okay, they're fine with it. They're not just going to hand you freaking nitric acid, right? I usually went over there for the chemistry and they would give it to me. I got one for, one for aluminum somewhere and then I got steel. Stainless, the best one I've ever used is the same stuff they used to passivate stainless. Uh, stainless, after, after it's been welded, they put, they have to passivate it, they put an acid on it to make it so that it doesn't eventually break down and rust. And that acid we used uh, to etch stainless um, the best. We did a chucks actually, you had a passivator there. It looks like a vacuum, this acid comes out and it sucks it back in as soon as it spits it back out and they just go right down the joint. Real water, uh, water out of the faucet is garbage, right? Water doesn't co conduct electricity, right? Everybody knows that, real water. The water that comes out of the faucet is not real water, it's full of all kinds of garbage stuff. So when I say real water, I mean distilled water, right? I don't know if you're confused on that. Distilled water, I was supposed to the distillation process to re remove all the metals and salts and whatever else is in the water. If you live in Frewsburg, there's a lot of lead in it, right? I know I saw it in the paper, so that's my jab at Frewsburg. Real water. They, they say that the, the TIG welders out there are water cooled, and they always said distilled water on it. And I said, ah, stick that hose in there. <laughs> I stuck a hose in it. And uh, as soon as I struck an arc, it went, and shocked me. I was like, well, that's why they saved it. Distilled water, right? Because <laughs> water out of the faucet conducts electricity because it's all full of that nastiness. But it turns out you really have to use <laughs> distilled water if you, or if you put water in a water cooled welder. I don't know. Not a real bad shot, but it lets you know you're alive. Uh, the specimen is immersed. Face down in the etch it. Let's just do that, ah, huh? there we go. For a certain amount of time. There is no prescription for time. You don't put it in there for 30 seconds and pull it out. You gotta get used to doing it. If it's not long enough, Be under etched and you won't be able to see the configurations. Too long. It will be over etched. Again, I'm not going to write it again. It's hard to see. Once it's spaced out. And then that gene is stopped. By placing the specimen under a stream of water. Everybody rubs it off basically with a paper towel. Usually they take it and they set it on the paper towel and dab it like this. If you're looking for penetration on a well, you might be able to get away with that. But if you're going to put it under a microscope, 
the bueno. You should not, it even says in the book, not to do that. You should not rub off the etching with a towel or it will alter the surface condition. Again, you can get away with it if you're looking at it with the naked eye. If you're going to a microscope, it's going to screw it up. Now, I videoed myself demagnetizing a piece of steel and doing an etch. That is what we're going to look at next. We are done with notes for the day. You officially have a quiz. We're going to go, we're going to go 36 here. It's already bolded. Quiz. Next class. With an exclamation point. We'll watch these videos and then we'll get out of here.